Welcome to Small Arms Solutions. Today we're going to talk about the Breda ARX-100, the new Italian uh, military rifle. Uh, but first I want to give a little bit of a background on uh, modern Italian small arms uh, to see where this rifle came from and, uh, and where it's at right now. In the 1950s, uh, when NATO was formed, um, part of the NATO uh, standards was they wanted to have uh, compatible ammunition. So you had uh, NATO uh, calibers. Uh, that way any of our allies would be able to get resupplied by uh, anybody else and have ammunition that would work. So at that time in the 50s, the first NATO trial was the 7.62 NATO. So the Italians went from the World War II era 6.5 Carcano uh, bolt-action rifle to the, which referred to as the BM-59. And what the BM-59 is, is really a modified M14, 20-round um, magazine. Um, I would not consider it an assault rifle by any means. It was, uh, it was just as just as heavy. It was uh, just as much recoil, uh, twenty round magazine, um, American made. You know, oddly enough, uh, that was one of the first times you really saw an American design being used by the Italians. Uh, traditionally, uh, the Italian military has always made its own small arms. Uh, Beretta is the oldest, uh, well, the oldest gun company in the world. It's also, the, as far as, as far as I know, the oldest family-run business. Um, it's been uh, going since 1526, and Beretta has always been charged with manufacturing the military small arms for uh, the Italian armed forces, uh, whether it be pistols, rifles, machine guns. Um, they've always been very self-sufficient in that way. So it was sort of interesting when they actually went to the, uh, you know, the M14 design and the BM59. Now we'll fast forward to the 1970s. In the 1970s, uh, after the M16 had proven itself in Vietnam with a small caliber high velocity cartridge, um, Italy had decided to uh, not only to rethink the battle rifle, but to rethink the caliber as well. So they adopted the 5.56 millimeter uh, M193 ball, or the 55 grain full metal jacket, and they developed their own rifle called the AR-70. Uh, the AR-70 was a modern assault rifle, uh, manufactured and designed by Beretta. Uh, it was a long stroke uh, piston operated uh, firearm, selective fire, um, proprietary components, uh, Proprietary magazine, very well built rifle. Uh, I, you know, but it was a battle. It was a. It was a t for the time. It was a battle rifle with the iron sights. Uh, the rifle had served quite well. Uh, now we're going to skip forward to the 1980s with the second round of NATO trials. This is where the 5.56 NATO cartridge was approved. For those of you who don't know, there was two 5.56 millimeters. The, the, the original 5.56 millimeter, which was the uh, 55 grain full metal jacket, that was not NATO. That was strictly U.S. military. Uh, the NATO cartridge was the SS-109 uh, or the uh, M855 ball, which was the projectile uh, that was adopted by NATO. So with the heavier 62 grain projectile, uh, the rifle had to be modified or redesigned to fire this new NATO cartridge. So now comes the upgrade for it, the AR-7090, uh, 90 for the year that uh, it, went into, it went into production. Now the main differences between the AR-70 and AR-7090 is this. number one is the magazine. Uh, it uses a NATO standard M16 magazine. And number two is the barrel was modified from the original 1 in 12 inch twist of the AR-70 to the one in seven of the uh, you know, the current NATO cartridges, so you could use the uh, 62 grain uh, full metal jacket with the steel penetrator core. And that rifle has served uh, you know the Italian military well. Uh, the actual details of the AR-7090 is a different story, but we're going to concentrate on the two biggest features of the AR-7090, which is a change in the, uh, the barrel twist, rated twist, from 1 in 12 to 1 in 7, and the change of the magazine to the uh, standard Stenag uh, AR-15 M16 type magazine. Now comes the 2000s. Uh, now it's time for it's time for an upgrade uh, with the use of 1913 rails and optics. Um, so you know, Bruno was ready uh, to take on the challenge of building the next Italian assault rifle. And what we have here is the culmination of um, all their research and development and feeling. Um, this is actually the commercial version called the ARX100. The military version is called the ARX160. Um, this is a very interesting rifle. Uh, in fact, it is probably the most uh, complete uh, ambidextrous rifle in the industry. Um, it completely mirrors everything. Not only does it mirror the, uh, the selector, bolt catch, and magazine release, but also ejection. Um, we're going to go over basically how we, uh, we, we switch 
uh, ejection patterns uh, from the left to the right hand side in, in a minute. Uh, as you can see the rifle is significantly made of polymer. Um, in fact uh, I probably would say it's mostly polymer. Uh, the, you have polymer shell, even the trigger mechanism itself uses some polymer. We have a continuous mill standard 1913 rail on the top and we have removable rail segments at, uh, on the, the right and left side. In the bottom we have one here. Uh, I'm, here's a removable guard here for installing a grenade launcher, uh, but Breda also offers a uh, attachment there for extending the Millsander 1913 rail if you wanted to attach a vertical pistol grip, for instance. Um, looking at some of the more uh, external features right now, uh, you want to take a look at the iron sights. Looking at the iron sights, uh, these were actually manufactured and designed by Beretta. They're interesting. Um, quite frankly, uh, this rifle, the first thing I'd do is probably get these off of here and get some really low profile sights. Uh, but these are built very robust. To engage, you push on the lever and they engage. This is a six position round front sight. Uh, the round post similar to the M16A1. Um, but again, very unique because it has six positions instead of uh, the, the original four. Uh, this is where all of your elevation is done. Uh, this is not adjustable for windage at all. Um, to, re to reinstall, you push down all the way and you push the lever from the uh, opposite side and that locks it in place. Very uh, durable, uh, very simplistic and functional. Uh, again, the only complaint that I would have with these is that it's just too big. Um, I, I would prefer to have something a little smaller. Now we're going to take a look at the back. These are engaging the exact same way by pushing the lever. Now, this is interesting because it actually uses a, uh, a rotating dial depending upon the range. Um, I believe there's, uh, there's six different dials. Um, you know, starting at the uh, lower numbers, you have the larger for, uh, uh, for um, short range, and then they gradually, as the, as the range gets down, they will actually get smaller. Um, this is a very, very interesting uh, approach. Um, I have zeroed these and I didn't have any problems with them whatsoever. Uh, again, it's big. Um, depending on the scope that you would put on this thing and how low that the rear of the scope would be, this, these could be a problem for as far as that's concerned. Uh, if it's high enough, for instance, with the, uh, the DI optic on here with the red dot, you actually do have co-witness between the front and the rear sight, which is good. Uh, it doesn't hang over enough to cause any problems, but if you put some of the ACOGs or whatnot in the back, there's a good chance if you don't have it really high mounted, it wouldn't fit. Now we're going to look at the, uh, some of these external features on it as well. The stock is reminiscent of the SCAR stock. Uh, it's very similar in concept. Uh, you have uh, folds and then it will fold to the rear. Uh, very similar to the SCAR. This is fully closed. Uh, you have a plastic latch on here um, that, uh, that holds it to the side. It does not interfere with ejection nor the use of the, uh, the safety on the, uh, on the right side. Um, so it does give you a you know a little more of a compact package. Now the one thing I will say about the stock is it was designed for somebody who is uh, sort of a shorter in standard in stature. Uh, myself, I'm you know, I'm about six foot two, and this is not long enough really for me. Uh, so I'm hoping that Beretta uh, is going to come out in the near future with a uh, a longer stock. On the right, okay, we're looking at uh, vertical pistol grip. You have one module right here, which we're going to see in a little bit, which is for the fire control group magazine pistol grip. Uh, the pistol grip is actually molded uh, as part of the uh, lower receiver. You have an ambidextrous safety, uh, safe semi, and of course you have an auto, you know, in the way this is written, it's a uh, safe, and then we have one shot. Um, we have the magazine release, and here is a bolt release. Uh, this is ambidextrous, and then from the, from the bottom here we have a bolt release as well. So we push upward, pull back, and push up. Now we're lock open to the rear. Then the ambidextrous closes it. We do also have a, a couple different uh, attachments for a sling here. Uh, one at the rear. Going to the left side, as we, as we see, same thing. Everything is perfectly mirrored. Ambidextrous magazine catch. You have your uh, bolt catch here, as well as the bottom uh, safety. Um, again, we have the, the, the rails that on, on the side that are removable. And then looking forward here, um, 
this is a this is an external piston short stroke tappet. We do have a, a valve on here uh, for suppressed and unsuppressed. So right here, um, you can see the N. Uh, the N refers to normal conditions. And then to switch it, you merely take a cartridge and move it over. Now we're in the suppressed mode of fire. So uh, all you're using to rotate that is just a projectile. So again, put it in. rotate it now you can do it right right now it can be done with with but with your hands but once you get uh, some carbon in there it gets it all stiff uh, you won't be able to you wouldn't be able to move it you're gonna have to use a cartridge or a suitable tool you do have a sling swivel on there as well now the barrel itself uh, is a hammer forged chrome line barrel uh, it has a standard a2 style flash suppressor compensator uh, one and seven inch twist and this is actually a hammer forged barrel uh, which uh, these days is, a, is, is quite considered a, a benefit. Um, you know, accuracy with this rifle is, is military grade accuracy. It's not something that you're going to be punching holes in the same, you know, same hole. Um, you know, my groups were anywhere from uh, one and a half to uh, three inches at 100 yards, uh, depending on the ammunition. Um, most of the problems uh, with this rifle uh, for me uh, revolved around the trigger itself. Um, the trigger is extremely heavy on this uh, on this rifle. Uh, it's definitely a military grade trigger. It's not going to go off unless you want it to. Um, it's heavy enough to the point where when you're shooting a lot of rounds, I, I fired over 300 rounds out of this thing, uh, and I have to say that my tr my trigger finger actually got a little bit fatigued because of how heavy it was. Uh, if uh, you're out there, Bill Geisley, this is a target of opportunity to, to uh, make a proper trigger for this. Um, that will break clean. Uh, for as far as the accuracy, I, I think if it had a better trigger on it, I think this would be you know, just as accurate as any AR. Uh, again, it was it's uh, it's very well made. Now we're going to take a look at uh, the magazine itself. Uh, it comes with a steel magazine uh, from Beretta. Um, it uh, I believe it's probably made in Italy as well. Uh, it actually says on the magazine P Beretta, um, and it has a it has a, a code on there or a part number. Uh, it's actually, it's a national stock number, uh, PB for Pietro Beretta. Uh, excellent magazine, very durable. It's all metal. Now, when I actually fired uh, this, I used several uh, other other magazines uh, for compatibility. Uh, that would include the uh, the Lancer AWMs work perfect. Uh, I utilized uh, uh, Ultimag. I used uh, HK High Reliability, HK Polymer, um, Hera Arms. Uh, P Mag Gen 2s. The only magazine that I had found in, uh, in all the magazines that I used that wouldn't fit was actually the P Mag Gen 3. The P Mag Gen 3 has this lip uh, right here, as you can see it, and it, this is actually a, a magazine stop to keep it from over traveling. Unfortunately for this, it, it won't it won't engage. So uh, unless you were to modify the magazine by removing that, which you really wouldn't want to do, uh, this is just not a, a magazine that you'd be able to use on this rifle. But again, if you were to get a, a Magpul Mo magazine or a Generation uh, 2 magazine, uh, there would be no problem. Um, I particularly like the, the, the Lancer magazines in here. Uh, they, uh, they work very well. Um, every magazine that I put in this thing dropped free as well. Uh, so its compatibility is there. Uh, with with most magazines in the market. Um, the next thing I want to show you is the ambidextrous features. Now if you notice the charging handle here is on the right side. Now this is one other little point of contention that I have uh, with this rifle. Uh, again I have size Sasquatch hands. Notice here you have the fire cartridge case deflector. When you go to pull the bolt back this thing will scrape right in the side of your knuckle and it hurts. Uh, and it happens to me pretty much every time that I pull it back, so I gotta try to get as, as far from the corner as I can to actually get to it. Now, according to Gabriel Deplano at Beretta, there is actually a, uh, a slip over uh, latch for this that extends that out. Um, I was hoping to get one in time to do this video, which I don't know if it's gonna make it in time, I don't think it's going to, but supposedly Beretta has fixed this. But uh, let's take a look at what makes this thing so ambidextrous. If you notice, there are Injection port is open on both sides. So when you pull the bolt to the rear, you can see right through it. 
Now, the one uh, negative thing about this is uh, when you have it open on both sides, regardless of whether you're on the right side of the rifle or the left, you're going to get some debris in the face. And especially if you're using a sound suppressor. Um, that's really the only negative aspect that I see I see to this. But uh, say you are your left-handed shooter, or per perhaps you just like to have your charging handle on the other side. Some guys like to be able to manipulate it like this. Uh, myself, I, I prefer it over here, it's just more familiar. And not to mention the only time that I would actually use this latch is to load for the first time. Uh, and I would I load from the open bolt position. So what we're gonna do is you have a notch right here. As we pull back the bolt, that will pull out like so. Now if you notice with the bolt in the lock position is in the unlock position, we take that, we rotate that all the way around and to the, to the left side, hit it. Now the charging handle is converted over to the left side. So again, if you're a right-handed shooter and you like being able to use it like this, or if you're left-handed. Now, if we want to change the ejection pattern, the way it came from the factory, it was set for right-handed shooters. It would eject the cartridge cases out of the right-hand side. Now comes a left-handed shooter. He wants to check, change that. So you just change the charging handle over. Now we're going to take the tip of a projectile and there is a little button right here. We push that until it clicks, and now the ejection will be on the left side. So now this rifle will be fully ambidextrous for a left-handed person. Not only would you have the selector, mag catch, and bolt catch available on the left side, but now your ejection pattern will come out the left side as well. So to change it back, all we would do is we would go back over to that side, take your projectile, push inward on that. Now we're going to adjust it back over so it's going to eject from the right. Pull the bolt back, lift out, push forward. Again, I have size Sasquatch hand so it makes it a little difficult getting, getting to it. Pull all the way to the rear. It's ready to go. This is definitely something that no other rifle has. Uh, the closest I've seen to any of this uh, with this receiver would be uh, the Faxon Firearms. Uh, the ARAC 21, the new receivers they have are just like this for as far as having it open on both sides. Um, the difference is, is how the uh, the bolt works. Uh, on this one here, you have a, a system in there where actually where it, it uses uh, uh, two rods, uh, depending on which one's uh, depressed, is whether you get a right-handed or left hand ejection. The Faxon bolt, um, instead of having the uh, peening on one side of the uh, cam hole in the bolt, uh, which prevents you from inserting the uh, cam pin into it, to so make sure it's always assembled right with the extractor uh, to the right, they remove that uh, that peening, so you just rotate the bolts over so the extractor is uh, facing the left, and install it, install it like that. Uh, so. This system here is, is, is mechanically a little more complex than that, uh, but so far uh, as, as my shooting is concerned and uh, all the research I've done, uh, it, it's very durable and very reliable. But again, this this is a this is the most ambidextrous rifle that I've I've come across. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go over the detail stripping uh, so we can take a look at some of the uh, components in the inside. What we're going to do now is we're going to do a complete uh, disassembly field stripping of this rifle. And we're going to take a look at some of the uh, really interesting internal features of it as well. Uh, to disassemble, of course, we're going to check and ensure that it's empty. And we're going to rotate the stock. You push the button, rotate the stock. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take the safety and we're going to push upward on the safety and then inward on the back. And this is the actual trigger module itself. So right now we're just going to take a qu quick look at the trigger module itself. Interestingly enough, uh, there is a lot of use of polymer uh, in the trigger mechanism itself. If you look at the hammer itself, it's actually inside of a piece of polymer. The disconnector, which you see right here, is also polymer. Um, you know, this particular rifle I'm actually planning on keeping. Uh, and I'm going to be doing some extensive testing on it. I, I just want to see for myself how all these polymer components uh, hold up. You know, the simple fact is that this rifle is in use with the Italian military, uh, so obviously it's gone through trials and testing to show that this is a good system. So taking a look inside, 
Uh, you also see your your safety again, like the uh, you know the standard AR-15 M16. You cannot engage the safety unless the hammer is cocked. Now, looking at the uh, the bolt catch itself. Now, if you get from either side, you can see how it rises up, as well as when we push from the bottom, we push up. You can see how the, it will engage. Get magazine release right, magazine uh, left. Uh, this is actually a very, very, very sturdy polymer. Uh, I definitely can't see it breaking uh, by no means. Um, it looks like it's incredibly durable. Um, this again, this is the ARX 100, the semi-automatic only. Um, there's uh, obviously the Italian military uses a uh, selected fire version, um, which is also available to uh, law enforcement here in the United States. Now we're going to take a look at the actual bolt itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull the bolt back right to that point where we uh, pull, so we can pull it out. Now we're going to rotate that right to the middle. So we're in, we're in the straight position. Now we're going to pull that right out. And here is the actual bolt carrier bolt uh, mechanism. So to disassemble, we push inward on the spring. That will slide right outward. Now when we look on the bottom, we have the actual uh, bolt itself. Rotate that, comes right out. Uh, this is all one piece. You don't have to worry about uh, anything other than just wiping that down, cleaning, cleaning that. Now, as we were talking about uh, how the ambidextrous uh, system works on this, depending on which side is depressed, you have two uh, you have two extract extractors. That extractor will become the ejector. So, for instance, uh, right now we're going to be uh, ejecting from the right side. There's a piece of metal that uh, supports this, so when the bolt comes back, it pushes outward, and this works as the uh, ejector. So then we're going to move over to the uh, to to the left. So now that the uh, latch works for, that works um, the ejector on the right. So it uses this as an ejector instead of a, a uh, extractor. So. So again, as we see how the uh, the ejectors work, again, uh, right side uses the left side uh, to eject. Right side uses the left side to eject. And this sits in just like so. And you can see there's actually uh, a notch right here. So what's going to happen here is this is set up for right ejection. So you can see this that the metal plate is going to be over the uh, left uh, ejector. So as it pushes back, into the receiver, you'll see how that pushes out for the ejector. And then to switch it over, we push forward on here. Now it pushes it over. So now it pushes on the, on the one on the right. So that's actually how the mechanism works to switch the ejection pattern. That right, right back where it was to left. So really, this assembly of the uh, the bolt carrier rather simple. Take a projectile, we push inward on the firing pin, then we lift the uh, the cam pin out. And here's the firing pin and firing pin spring. Uh, for regular maintenance, um, the soldier would not disassemble the, uh, the, the uh, any further. As you can see, these extractors, uh, well, extractors slash ejectors, are pinned in place. Uh, it's not something that you would be removing uh, for regular routine maintenance. But uh, the simplicity is uh, is there. Uh, it's, it's funny, as complex as you might think the uh, the you know, extraction and ejection system is being uh, ambidextrous. It's uh, it's really rather simple. The last thing that we're going to be able to take out of this is the actual barrel itself. Now we have two uh, levers. This is very similar to just assembling a Glock pistol. You have one on here and one here. We're going to pull downward on that, and we're going to lift 
the barrels will send me right out. So here's the actual uh, barrel assembly. You can see we have the short stroke uh, piston on the, on, the, on the top here. Uh, we have the gas valve. Um, this can be easily done uh, as, you, as you just saw by the uh, end user for uh, easy maintenance. And then this is really your plastic shell. Uh, you can see that uh, it's a very thick polymer. Um, I have not yet heard or seen any of these actually break, so the material seems to be extremely strong. And as you see, this whole thing was disassembled with no tools, um, just just a cartridge uh, for a couple of these components. And uh, everything is easy to easy to wipe down. Um, barrels manganese phosphate. This is more of a uh, of a bluing type. Uh, looks actually it actually looks like it's a brewing type finish, similar to the M9. I'm not sure exactly what that finish is. Um, but it, it, it appears to be more of like the, the prototype like the M9 uses. But uh, this is all your basic uh, components for the uh, ARX100, ARX160. You know, they do have some larger components in here uh, that uh, they're a lot less easier to lose. For instance, like in an M16, you don't have a small, a small firing pin retaining pin. You have all larger uh, components. And with this also being a uh, external piston or short stroke tappet, you don't have as much fouling that's going to enter into this bolt carrier itself. Uh, to really have to worry about any maintenance other than having it go back to an armor to have this disassembled. Um, the only time you really have to worry about that is if you're using it suppressed. Uh, because using it suppressed doesn't matter if it is an external piston or not. You're still going to get all kinds of debris uh, and back in the bolt mechanism because of all the overpressure that's coming back out the chamber. Um, you know, the actual components themselves are extremely well made. This is what you would expect from Beretta. You don't see machining marks on them. Uh, and it's a good military grade uh, weapon. You also can notice on here, you'll see uh, an MP stance stamped. MP is magnetic particle improvements and proof tested, which means uh, they take a 70,000 PSI proof cartridge. They will test the bolt and the barrel with it because the barrel also has the MP on it, as you can see right here. MP and MP. Uh, this is definitely a sign of a military grade manufacturer. Um, what an MP is, is again, you uh, you proof test the barrel and the bolt with a 70,000 PSI proof cartridge. And then once you're done with that, you uh, magnetic particle inspect or magnaflux. Uh, what you're doing is looking for any stress fractures uh, in the material. Uh, this will ensure that when it actually leaves the, uh, the factory, uh, that there is no stress fractures in it. Is it, a fail, is it a fail safe that there's no issues? No. But if there's a very slight uh, cracks, it will show up in the, in the Magnaflux. Again, that's, that's military grade uh, manufacturing. What we're going to do now is we're going to go through reassembly. Uh, we want to make sure that the uh, external piston is in the forward position. And we'll hear it click. Now the barrel's back in, pl in place. Now for reassembly, we're going to reassemble the bolt carrier group. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take make, make sure you have the, uh, the firing pin spring on there. That needs to be on there. We're going to drop that in place. And now I'm going to take a projectile tip and I'm going to hold that firing pin closed. And we're going to drop the cam pin back in place. And just bang on the ground there and make sure that uh, it doesn't drop out. Now when we look at the actual uh, bolt itself and, and the, the carrier, you actually will see where the cam track is uh, machined into the face. So we push the bolt forward until the cam track engages. Now we will lock and unlock. So now we're going to lock that in place so that it won't go anywhere. Now we're going to take the recoil spring, push it through. Rotate until it locks into the grooves. Make sure everything is straight. Now we're going to install, insert the uh, bolt carrier mechanism into the receiver itself. Now I have to replace the uh, position of the charging handle. Push forward, slide forward, bolt will now lock into place.
Now we're going to insert the lower receiver. Again, we're going to push back up into that position to unlock. And now we'll do a function check on it. Make sure it's clear. We're going to place it on safe. Pull the trigger, nothing should happen. Go to semi. Pull the trigger, you should hear a click. While holding the trigger, pull the bolt back to release it. Hear a metallic click. Pull the trigger again, hear a click again. We're good to go. Lock the bolt to the rear, pull back, push upward on the bolt catch. And as you see, it takes uh, you know a minute to reassemble the rifle. Polymer actually, uh, the receivers like this, when you actually do the maintenance on it for cleaning, just regular routine cleaning, um, the dirt, the grit, and the oil don't stick to the uh, polymer at all, so it's very easy to clean. Uh, another thing to notice about the polymer too is the inside of it is very slippery. And uh, believe it or not, that actually works more of a, of a lubrication or lubricant type because uh, there's no friction. Uh, got because of how uh, how smooth and how slick that uh, that polymer is, which does not mean you don't need oil. Uh, like any other mechanism where you have metal parts, uh, it does require oil. Uh, most of your oil for this would be required uh, in the uh, in the carrier group uh, where the cam track is, where that metal's on metal. Uh, that's where most of your lubricant would be. Again, with a polymer receiver, you don't have much that can rust. Uh, the only part you really have to worry about is the uh, the barrel assembly uh, and the bolt mechanism. Um, it's a good military uh, chrome line hammer forged barrel and again with it being a one and seven inch twist it will handle any uh, NATO cartridge out there everything from the uh, 62 grain uh, NATO ball right up to the 77 grain OTMs. Now we're going to take the Breda Air X100 out to the range and we're going to see what it can do. Um, what we have here is the Beretta ARX100, which is the commercial version of the ARX160 uh, US, it's actually the Italian military service rifle. This rifle is probably the most ambidextrous rifle uh, on the market. Um, it is fully convertible uh, left and right. Um, what we're going to show you here is uh, a couple of the neat features before we do uh, a lot more of the test firing. But uh, first, as we can see right here, we have the uh, charging handle located on the right side. Also, we have the ejection port on the right side. We're going to fire a couple rounds so you can see the normal left and right eject or left in the normal right ejection. So now let's say that we actually have us a left-handed shooter. We pull back to this little slot right here. We're going to pull back to this location right here. We're going to pull the charging handle out. Now we're going to flip it over. To the other side. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take a cartridge and we're going to push inward on that button. You're going to hear it snap. Now this is going to eject on the left hand side. So now with that engaged, as you saw we have now left-handed ejection and as we can also see on the side here we have fully mirrored controls. We have the ambidextrous safety, we have the ambidextrous bolt catch location here and under here, magazine release as well. So now I want to switch it back to uh, right-handed because I'm right-handed. With the safety engaged, magazine release, again we're going to pull it back to this location right here, pull out, rotate over. Now some people like having the, the uh, cocking handle on the right side or the left side. Um, I particularly like having it on the right side. So now we're back in location. And now from the opposite side, now I'm re-engaging that so now we're back to full right configuration. So push downward on the bolt catch.
we have a hair of arms magazine the only magazine i have found so far that will not work in this gun is the uh gen 3 mag pull because it actually has a uh, magazine stop on the rear Coil is quite manageable on here. Now we have the uh, Ultimag with Black Hills uh, 223 full metal jacket. The only complaint that I really have about this rifle is the trigger pull itself. The trigger pull is quite uh, heavy. Um, it probably has a lot to do with the way the trigger mechanism is. There's a lot of polymer in the trigger mechanism itself. So this, op this definitely leaves a uh, slot open for Geisley to come out with a uh, match trigger for it. Now we actually have the uh, magazine that came with it. This is a Beretta uh, manufactured magazine. Again with Black Hills, 5.56 millimeter ammunition. Overall, this is a very pleasant gun to shoot. Um, like I said, it's just, it's just that trigger. It's just that the trigger is heavy, um, and it can make your, your finger a little on the fatigue side, especially if you're trying to do any kind of precision shooting. But overall, this is a very it's very reliable, um, comfortable to shoot. Recoil impulse is nice on it. Um, it definitely represents some of the, one of the state of the art of the industry. Um, ambidextrous is a very sought after feature. There's many ambidextrous rifles out there, but this takes it that much further with having a adjustable uh, ejection uh, pattern, basically meaning we can go either to the right or the left side, and it's done by the individual user. It doesn't have to have an armor to do it. So once you switch it over, uh, you know, you're all set, and then the rifle passes to somebody else, they can adjust it over for right hand or left hand or whatever you have. Um, another feature on this thing that uh, Beretta actually has taken care of, but I don't have the component here yet, is when you have uh, your big hands to operate the, the lever, when you pull back, the, uh, the fire cartridge case deflector will actually scrape the hell out of your knuckles just because the charging handle is shorter. Now, it's, again, it's shorter because it has to be able to rotate through the receiver to go to the other side. 
Uh, Beretta does have actually a uh, clip-on clip extension that uh, I'm hoping to have before I do the second part of this video uh, that actually shows that uh, they've actually corrected that issue so you don't actually bust your knuckle every time you want to open up on the, uh, uh, the bolt. Um, the stock again does flip over to the side. We do have adjustable in the rear, very similar to the FN SCAR. Um, the stock was designed for people who were of normal stature. Uh, again, with myself being size Sasquatch uh, with long arms, um, it's a little short for me. Um, so hopefully Brent is going to be coming out with a uh, longer stock in the future for those of us who were a little bit on the longer side. But overall, it's definitely an excellent rifle. Uh, it's without a doubt uh, the most ambidextrous rifle in the industry. Uh, the only other company that I'm aware of that has uh, a similar uh, a system similar to this is uh, Bax and Firearms. Um, and that's basically done just by rotating the bolt. Uh, so the ejector is either on the, or the extractor is either on the right or the left hand side. Uh, so it's, it's similar in concept, but it, uh, the actual execution is a bit different. Um, but this definitely uh, is well suited for the Italian military. There's some other militaries who are interested in it as well. Um, this actually was a, this was in competition as well for the individual carbine, uh, which, have, which unfortunately that program was a failure. Uh, but it did do very well in that uh, as well. The Breda Air X100 definitely represents uh, one of the most modern rifles uh, in, in the industry today. You know, several companies have, uh, have used polymers, uh, you know, such as Steyr AUG, for instance. Um, this actually probably makes the most use of polymers of any gun I've ever seen. Um, but the way that it's designed, um, it's not really a flaw. Um, you know, when I've shot this, the thing gets quite hot, and it, 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 it does get quite hot. Um, so, you know, I'm probably going to be putting some man rail covers on, on here, and maybe even putting a vertical grip on it, uh, just because, it, you know, it does get hot. But uh, at no point did I ever see any melting of any of the, uh, the polymer, uh, so, you know, I, I don't, I'm not concerned about that at all. Uh, for as far as the reliability with this thing, you know, I probably fired, uh, I probably put almost 500 rounds through this thing uh, in between to go into the range twice with it and there was not a single malfunction uh, the ammunition I used was everything from uh, regular uh, Lake City ball 62 grain 55 grain 77 grain um, it took everything uh, and went right through it no problem again magazines uh, this is compatible with every magazine I tried which is quite a few except for just the Magpul uh, Gen 3's um, if you are looking for uh, an ultra modern assault rifle or some automatic modern sporting rifle. This is definitely a good choice. And if you're left-handed, this is by all means a rifle that you should look at because you won't find another rifle uh, out there that is this ambidextrous. Um, so again, if you're a lefty, this is definitely the way to go. Um, I expect to see this rifle around for quite some time. Uh, being that it's a military rifle, it is for sale overseas. Um, I do recall seeing a picture of a of a police officer in Colombia carrying one of these also, so Breda is getting international contracts. And another very important thing to know about this rifle is um, during the individual carbine program, there was a down select, there's only like four manufacturers left uh, when the uh, competition ended. And the ARX was one of them. So the ARX along with the, uh, the FN SCAR, um, the uh, AgCorp Bear, and I believe the fourth one was the uh, the Remington uh, ACR. So, considering all the guns that dropped out of the uh, of the trials, it was one of the four finalists, and that says something about its durability and its reliability. Um, in the in the end, uh, the individual carbine pro program was canceled uh, for many reasons. Um, the government said there was no true winner of it because. Uh, when they finally decided to give the manufacturers access to the new uh, M855A1 ammunition, not one of the rifles that was uh, available uh, was able to make it through the test because of the uh, very, very different operating characteristics of that ammunition. The ammunition had a much higher uh, uh, chamber pressure. You know, the average uh, uh, 556 uh, ball, uh, the, uh, the the NATO cartridge, you're looking at around 55,000 psi. Well, the uh, M8 55A1 uh, has about 63,000 psi. I mean, if you remember, uh, I actually told you the uh, proof cartridge is 70,000 psi. 63,000 psi, 70,000 psi. 
normal is 50 to 52 to 55,000 psi. So what that gives you is a lot higher pressures, which means your parts are working a lot faster. You're going to have a much higher rate of fire, um, especially when you get gas port erosion. That's going to cause problems with uh, the rate of fire even increasing further. And not to mention the actual projectile itself has caused damage to uh, the barrel extensions and uh, the receivers on the M4s. So, uh, well, I guess we also probably mentioned the issue that uh, you get a half barrel life with the uh, M855A1 also. Uh, so, the M855A1 pretty much defeated every every rifle that uh, was in the individual carbine program. Uh, which is a shame that they didn't have this ammunition uh, ahead of time, uh, you know, all four of the companies, so they could have actually built a rifle around this new cartridge. But for some reason, Uncle Sam is uh, super secretive about it. They won't give it to anybody, which, again, doesn't make any sense since uh, the same mission is used by the Army throughout Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, the ammunition has been captured. The enemy's already got it. Uh, so, uh, the secret's out. As soon as you, you put it in the battlefield, the secret's out. But uh, some of that ammunition has uh, leaked it leaked out. And um, I will tell you that I'm working on a future video. Uh, that's going to be specifically on the uh, M855A1 that I think you'll find interesting. Uh, but uh, I wanted to mention that just because uh, you know the history of the ARX160 uh, sort of intertwines a little bit with the M855, the individual carbine. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you do, please click like and please subscribe. Thank you.